So yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about state machines with this library I worked on for the last months, I would say, uh, which I called Cram, and the name will be clearer uh, in a few minutes. And so I'd like to start this with just a little bit of history, maybe, uh, maybe just to give you some context why I did this and why I am interested in this kind of things. Uh, so I'm, I worked a lot in working, developing applications in the real world, especially web applications. And I encountered, uh, several times, uh, a concept called domain driven design, uh, while working on those applications and in domain driven design, there are several ideas going around, but, uh, one, uh, which I'm particularly interested in is uh, one specific kind of architecture, which is somehow depicted in this picture I'm showing you. So this picture is not exactly an architectural diagram. It is more the explanation of a workshop that you do, which is called event storming, where you gather a lot of people, technicians, domain experts, and basically whoever uh, is interested in an application which needs to be understood, and you need to extract information about in a room and you basically stick a lot of post-its on a wall uh post-its of different colors uh, and every color has different meanings uh but actually this could be quite easily translated directly uh, or fairly directly into software uh, and every post-it color has kind of a particular meaning so let's try to explain what is going on here going through the different post-it colors one by one so the most important ones are the orange ones, which are events, which basically describe the state transitions of your domain. Uh, so instead of considering which is the current state of your domain at every time, what you're interested in is how does the state of your system changes all the time. And you are interested in collecting all these state changes. Another relevant concept is one of commands, uh, which, which are described by the blue post-its, uh, which basically describe the user in, intentions, interactions, actions, on decisions. So basically every time the user would like the system to do something, uh, it would submit a command to the system. Uh, then we have, I mean, uh, the color is not the best, but we have read models down here which are basically data collection uh, where the user would ask queries to. So basically, if the user needs to retrieve some information from your system, you would create a read model uh, where the user would basically go and ask for some information to retrieve. And with this data, the user, which is depicted here, will at that point probably make another decision and uh direct a new command to to the application to the system and then there are a few more concepts so there are aggregates which i mean the name is extremely confusing so don't uh be extremely interested in in that uh but in the literature they're called like that so i'm using that term and they're basically the main part of your domain logic. So it's basically the part of your system which decide what needs to happen when your system receives a command. So maybe you say to the system, pay this invoice and the aggregate will decide what will happen at that point. And then there are policies which are depicted by the purple stickies and they represent the reactive logic part of the of your domain so basically whenever something happens you want something else to happen after that and then the last part are the green stickies which are the so-called projections which basically are that the part of your system which from events so basically from the state changes of your data uh decide how to update the read model which is the information that the user has direct access to and so with all this component you basically have a complete picture of 
of a domain if you put all these things together. And you can ask yourself, well, you said you were talking about state machines, so why are we talking about a workshop involving stickies on a wall? Uh, well, basically because if you look carefully at them, uh, aggregates, projections, and policies uh, could all be implemented as state machines. So that's the point where my interest in state machine began, because we have, I mean, a way to represent entirely an application domain, and which is composed by several parts, and all of them could be implemented as state machines. So uh, basically, state machine play a huge role in if you model your domain uh, with this kind of architecture. And so just to take a better look at them, so aggregate basically are state machines, so stateful processes, if you want, uh, which consume commands coming from the user and produce events, which are state changes of your data. Projections instead take events and as inputs and emit new read models, so they, they update the, the read models. And policies, on the other hand, are uh, processes, stateful processes, which take events and produce uh, new commands. And so you, at this point, you have this three-stage machine. You can compose all of them to create, with one big state machine, uh, a model of your whole uh, application domain. And now the question comes, OK, this looks interesting, at least. So let's try to implement this thing somehow. And we want to use state machines, so the question is, how should we encode a state machine in our code? What's the type of a state machine? So if you look around in the literature uh, on the internet, and probably one definition of state machine you could encounter is looks something like this. Uh, so it's just a data type called melee, uh, which is indexed in three types, which are basically the, the sets uh, which uh, defines the various components of the state machine. So you have one type state, which uh, describes the possible values of the state space of your state machine. Input describes all the possible inputs that you can feed your machine with. And output describes instead all the possible values that you, you can get out of your, your machine. And then the, the concretely the machine is uh, made by two things. So uh, you have your initial state. So you need to state where your machine is, where you start basically with your machine. And then you have an action, which is nothing else, if, if nothing else is the correct term, uh, that uh, a stateful function. So you have uh, your initial state, you give it an input, and you get back a new state and an output. And if you want, you can have a slightly different encoding of a melee machine, which is what I mean uh, usually when I say state machine. I'm always talking about melee machines here, uh, and which is a little bit different. So uh, it is indexed in two things, not on three. So you don't see the state here. It's somehow implicit in this encoding. So you have only the input and the output. And it has only one thing. You don't have explicitly the initial state. Uh, but you have only one function, which, given an input, gives back to you uh, the output and a new machine, basically. So you get a new machine, which probably will have a different internal state. And so when you give an input to that machine, you probably get back something different than if you gave it to this machine. And the cool thing, the first cool thing about state machine uh, is that they are extremely composable. So for example, uh, we can compose them sequentially. So if we have uh, a MIDI machine which consumes inputs of type A and produce emits outputs of type B, and we have another one 
uh, receiving inputs of type B and emitting outputs of type C, we can compose them both just executing first, the first one, and then passing the outputs of the first one to the second one uh, to get basically a bigger milli machine which just consumes the input of the first machine and returns, uh, emits the outputs of the second machine. So this is just uh, kind of standard categorical composition. So you just perform thin things sequentially. But with state machine, you have also other kind of composition. So for example, you can execute two machines in parallel. Uh, suppose you have two completely separate state machine. So one is basically this one, where you receive inputs of type A and you emit, emit uh, outputs of type B, and another one which receives inputs of type C and emits outputs of type D. Uh, what you can do, you can just basically process them in both at the same time. So if you uh, have both uh, something of type A and something of type C, you can say, okay, I'll give the first component to the first state machine, the second component to the second state machine. I can execute both state machines and I get back a B and a D and I put them together again in a pair. And so what I get in the end is just uh, a more complex machine which receives an input a pair of an A and C and emits outputs of type B, D. And there's other ways, again, to compose state machines. For example, we can compose a state machine uh, alternatively. So we can decide either to use one or the other. So again, if we have two milli machine, uh, one going from A to B and one going from C to D. So this is one and this is the other. Uh, we can, if we have an either an A or a C, we can, depending on the fact if we have an A on a C or a C, we can decide uh, whether to use either the first machine or the second machine. And at this point, we will get back either a B or a D, which is this basically. And so in the end, we get a bigger machine, which uh, takes an either A, C, and returns an either CD. And again, there's even other ways we can compose state machines. For example, uh, this one is kind of fruit of my fantasy. I don't know uh, how much uh, it exists in the literature, but uh, it's something I needed, so it's there. Uh, so I call it feedback because basically you have two machines going in the opposite direction. So uh, consider one machine which takes inputs of type A and produces outputs of type list of B. And another one which receives B's as inputs and returns output of type list of A. So basically they go in the opposite direction. One goes from A towards B and one goes from B towards A they kind of form a cycle and you can compose them basically you run the first one you get the list of b's if the list is empty you're done uh, if the list is not empty you use the second machine to process all the elements you had in your list here and you get back basically a list of a's at the point you have a list of a's and you can use the first machine again uh, to compute basically to obtain a list of b's if the list is empty, okay, you're done. If it's not, you go again, uh, basically in a cycle. This could be an infinite loop, but uh, if you do things correctly, it will end uh, to do something useful. Uh, okay, so state machines are cool because they can be composed, uh, but at least with this encoding, the only thing we can do is run them basically. So if we have a state machine, the only thing we can do is give it an input and expect an output back, which is, I mean, it, it's not something uh, that we should not appreciate from a state machine, uh, but maybe we want something else also. So for example, uh, how can we 
document what state machine is doing. So if the only thing that we can do is run a state machine, we cannot extract information of how the state machine works uh, from the definition itself. So the only thing that we can do is maybe try uh, passing the state machines a lot of inputs and getting back a lot of outputs and check to see if some pattern emerged. But maybe that's not the, the most efficient way to get a documentation out of the state machine. Or uh, how can we enforce invariants uh, of our state machine? What if uh, we want a certain transition between certain states not to happen? Uh, at any time we want to forbid them uh, well we have no way the only way we have is that we need to implement things correctly and hope everything goes according to plan but we have basically no way to check that uh, certain invariants are observed so state machines uh, with this encoding are cool but there's still things we would like to, to add to them so one option that we have since I'm working uh, with Haskell with this, is try to go more fancy with our types. And so one thing that we could do is, for example, add some information about the topology of the state machines, I'll say what the topology is in a minute, uh, in the types of our state machine. So for example, we define a new type data machine, which has some topology at the type level, and then has some input and some output. Uh, and by topology, I mean just basically a graph of the allowed transition of the state machines. So uh, if we want to say, okay, this is just an example. So uh, from this particular state of a state machine, the only thing that we can do is either we stay put or we move to this other state. From this state, either we go down one of these two or we stay put, but we can never, let's say, go back or we can never go to collect all data. So uh, the topology is, yeah, uh, stated again, is just the graph of the allowed transition uh, of the state machine. So at this point, if we add the topology, uh, the type level, uh, we basically allow the user to enforce the execution only of allowed transition. So we give the user a way to say, OK, this transition is not allowed. It should never be performed. And so the consequence of this is that if you try to implement a transition which is not allowed, you would get out a compilation error, uh, which is very cool. Uh, but also, since we have the information stored at the type level, uh, we don't need to run our machine to extract that information. And so does using some type level machinery, we can retrieve this information about our state machine without running it. So basically we can have a function which takes the definition of our state machines and says, okay, just print me a drawing of the topology of that machine. So this is fairly cool. Uh, we can have more information about our state machine. We can enforce invariants, but uh, are we losing something? Well, yes, uh, because now composition, which was one of the perks of the previous encoding, becomes harder. Because what happens now? So let's try, for example, sequential composition. So if we have a machine which has inputs of type A and outputs of type B, and it has a topology P1, so this is the graph of a low transition, and we have another machine going from B to C with another topology, uh, we can compute the sequential composition of those machines to get back a new machine. So probably it will need to deal with inputs of type A and it will emit outputs of type C, but what will be its topology? So the, the answer is known. It's not super hard uh, even, but just writing this down here uh, requires, first, it requires computation at the type level, uh, which might be done, but it's not the best thing you would like to do in a language which is not dependently typed. And also, 
uh, it somehow breaks composability because it breaks the usage of standard type classes like arrow or category or something like uh, choice and strong from the profunctor uh, hierarchy. So uh, it basically forbids you to use some well-known, well-understood and commonly used type classes in the Haskell ecosystem and also, I mean, also which are not necessarily type classes, but just concepts like uh, the one of categories of profunctors, uh, which are lying around in the, in the ecosystem. And so at this point, we saw two encoding. Uh, one was easy to compose, but was hard to extract information out of it. The other was easier to extract information out of it, but it was harder to compose. Uh, so the question now is, can we actually get the best of both words? So can we get an encoding for state machine where we can easily compose them and we also can easily extract information about them? Um, well, I hope the expected answer at this point is yes, otherwise I will not be given this talk. And so uh, let's try to, to see uh, how we can try to do that. So first thing, uh, we need to define a new type. Just, let's call it state machine. And it first thing we could observe, it has two type parameters. So sorry, but the code highlighting here is kind of wrong. So this is part of the syntax because this is a, a GADT. Uh, so this is just part of the syntax, uh, it's not really relevant. So it has two type parameters, just input and output. So you see, we do not store the topology uh, at the type level for this specific data type. And so how do we build instances for this specific data type? Uh, so we do it in several ways. So first we have a basic, way of building a state machine, which is just by providing a machine. So the thing that we had before, where we had the topology at the type level. So we can build a state machine where we don't have the topology of the, at the type level by providing uh, uh, a value, a term of a type where there's more information. So basically in executing this constructor with somehow somehow losing information. Uh, I mean, we are not losing information, but we are exposing less information directly to the user because what the user will see is just a state machine in the end, which does not have the topology at type level. But uh, when we pattern match on, uh, on a state machine, we will be able to access again this machine here. So we'll be able to, uh, have access to this uh, information stored in the topology at the type level. And, and then to regain uh, compositionality, what we do is simply we add uh, specific constructors uh, for every uh, compositional operation that we wanted to do. Uh, so for example, we wanted to have sequential composition. So well, we just add a new constructor for that. And so this is a new constructor of a state machine. We just take two state machines and produce a new state machines where the types are aligned as you would expect. And similarly for parallel composition, you add a new constructor. Similarly again for alternative. And again, the same happens for feedback. So every time you want to compose your state machine in different ways, you need to add a new constructor to the state machine type. And at this point, what happens basically is that we are creating a tree where at every leaf, we have a basic machine, which is uh, a machine which has the topology at the, at, the, at the type level. So where the information about the topology is uh, present and, and inspectable. And the other nodes are always binary. 
and describe how we are composing the two lower uh, subtrees. So for example, in this case, we are saying that machine one and machine two are composed using parallel composition, and machine three and machine four are composed using alternative composition. And this subtree on the left and this subtree on the right are then composed with sequential composition. And so what you basically build is a, is a binary tree uh, where at every not leaf node, you describe how you compose the subtrees, and at the leaves level, you actually store the real the real information. And so, uh, what do we gain with this? So it is composable because yeah, we are somehow artificially putting in our composability because we are adding all the constructors that we need to actually compose. Uh, the various pieces. Uh, it's still executable, meaning you can run these machines because you just traverse your tree, all of it, uh, looking at where you need to start and then what you need to do at every step. So if you need to do sequential composition, you know that first you execute the first machine and then you execute the second. If you need to do parallel composition, you know uh, that you need to execute both and collect the results. Uh, if you have an alternative composition, you know that you need to check the input. If it's a left, you use one machine. If it's a right, you use the other machine, and so on and so forth. For every constructor, basically, uh, you describe how to execute the subtrees until you arrive to the leaves, uh, which are just mach machines, uh, which you know how to execute and how to run. And most of everything, at this point, things are, I call it representable. And this is, if you look at this, this is a start with a C, this is a start with a E, this start with an R. So if you swap those, the last two is C, R, E, and M stands for machine. So this is the origin of, of CREM. So composable, reproducible, uh, no, not reproducible, representable, executable machines. And talking about representable, uh, at this point, when we have this kind of tree, uh, we can again uh, use the information that we have on, at the leaves just to create a representation. I mean, uh, say, draw the state space, uh, create a graph of the state space of the leaves, because at that level, we have the information at the type level. So we know how to ext extract the information. And then, for example, when we compose two machines, uh, we know how we are composing them. And so we can use some, let's say, mm, external knowledge uh, to know uh, how the state space uh, will be combined. So if we have a parallel compose, well, basically any kind of composition of two machines, uh, the state space of the composed machine will be the product of the state spaces uh, of the two uh, machines which are composed. And so using this knowledge, uh, we can at every level basically compose the information that we have in the subtrees to create a representation of the, the whole tree. Uh, all right, well, this is what I basically say. And at this point, uh, what we can do, we can create drawing graphical representation of our machine. So for example, this is uh, one of the outputs which CRAM uh, can create. So as you see, this is, I mean, the, uh, the arrows are not shown very properly, but uh, let me try. So this is an example which uh, is, basically a representation of the architecture I was talking about in the beginning when I was sp speaking about domain-driven design. So you have your aggregate up here, which is a state machine which has this kind of uh, topology. So you start from this vertex and then you can only go here. From here, you can only go to one of these two. And then from both of these two, you can only go down here. 
And these three state machines instead are fairly trivial. I mean, their state space is just a single point. Uh, and here, if you can see, we have an arrow going down from the aggregate to the policy and one arrow going from the policy back to the aggregate. So this is actually uh, using the feedback constructor because these two run in a cycle. And, and then, I mean, these two together emit some events which are fed into the projection, which basically create uh, a read model, which is, I mean, this is just not really useful down here, but it's there. And okay, at this point, I would like to conclude with a little demo. And so the demo is just basically another way that you can use uh, the library to do something else, which is not a domain-driven design-inspired architecture. Uh, in this case, what I'll be showcasing is a text-based uh, adventure-like video game, uh, which is inspired from a Commodore 64 game of the 80s, uh, which was called The Hobbit. And so first, I'd like to, to show you the code uh, I had to write. Oh, dear. Uh, to, to implement this. Uh, so let's take a brief look. So I had to define the commands that my machine needs to receive. So basically, these are the possible things that the user can ask the, the game to do. So go east, west, north, south, wait, get key, or unlock door. Marco, can you make the font a touch bigger, please? Oh, yeah, I can try. Yeah, is this enough? Yes, thank you. OK, cool. And then what we need to do is we need to define the topology of our machine. So I am basically need to define a graph. So to define a graph, first I need to define the set of its states. So, it, well, this is it. So basically the, the graph will have this tunnel-like hole, lone lands, trolls clearing, Rivendell, Misty Mountains, Troll Path, and Trolls Cave, uh, possible states. And then I define the topology, basically which are the allowed transition in my, my game. So for example, from tunnel-like hole, I can only go to the lone lands. From the lone lands, I can either go to the tunnel-like hole or to the trolls clearing. From the trolls clearing, I can either go to Rivendell or to the trolls path, and so on and so forth. Basically, you're just describing the, the, the edges of a graph. And then you need to define your real state space. So the vertex was basically defining uh, the, the, the graph of the state space. And now you, you need to say for every vertex of your graph, uh, which information could be stored in that vertex. So for example, some vertices doesn't, don't have any information. So for example, tunnel-like whole state, this is just uh, the only way it holds no information and it's the only way to build something which stays in the tunnel-like hole vertex but for example the trolls clearing state uh, is a way to build something which goes in the troll clearing vertex but it contains some information which is a key state and the key state is for example uh, no key day dawn got key and door unlocked so it's some kind of information uh, that we want to store in that specific vertex of the graph. And then this state message is basically all the text that I need to write to provide a decent, uh, well, decent is maybe too much, but uh, a user interface uh, to the game. And then really the, uh, the, the logic of the game is, in this big function down here, which is the definition of my state machine, which is uh, constrained by the Hobbit topology we defined above. It receives some Hobbit commands and it emits some Hobbit messages. 
And so you need to define an initial state and you need to define the action. And remember the action basically was saying, uh, given a state, uh, for example, the tunnel-like whole state, and given an input, uh, where should we go in terms of state and output? So in this case, for example, for the tunnel-like whole state, if we receive the go east uh, input, uh, we go to the lone lands state, and the output will be computed uh, out of the, the new state. So you see here, so we have the state and the output is computed out of the same state. And so similarly for all the other states and possible inputs, I mean, for example, I don't know, if you are in the trolls path state and you receive go north, uh, depending whether uh, you have unlocked the door or not, you can either go to the trolls cave or you will remain in the trolls path. And yeah, uh, I mean, the implementation is not particularly interesting uh, at this point is just the, the boring part of your application of deciding what the game really needs to do and at this point i would like to go here maybe increase the font a little bit uh, more and okay so if let's try to play play the game so if i do kabar run hobbit game. So it tells us, welcome to the Hobbit adventure game. Uh, you are in a tunnel-like hole. You can only go east to the Lone Lands. So let's try to go east. OK, we got to the Lone Lands. You can either go west to a tunnel-like hole or go east to the Trolls Clearing. So let me just show that this is actually working. Let me play a little bit. So we go to the Trolls Clearing, and here we can either go north or we can go east. Uh, so we have only these two options. So let's say we go north, and here we can either go south or wait. And we do wait, and then we go south. And now we are back to the Trolls Clearing, like we were here. And as you see here, we had only two options. So we could go north or go east. Now, since we waited um, before, uh, we can also get the key for the troll scale. So obviously we get the key and we go back north. So now we are back in the trolls path. Before when we were in the trolls path, uh, we could either go south or wait. Uh, now we can also unlock the door. So we can unlock the door. And ta-da, we are in the Trolls path. Uh, uh, okay, we are in the Trolls path. And now we can go north because we were already in the Trolls path, but we could not go north. Now we can go north because we opened the door to the Trolls cave. And now we are in the Trolls cave. And okay, maybe this was extremely boring for you. I mean, implementing it uh, was kind of fun. And the interesting thing at this point is that uh, since we implemented uh, this state machine using CRAM, uh, what we can do is we can also generate a map of the game. So Hobbit map. And so if we run this, what we get out is a mermaid specification of a state diagram, which is, you see, these are just the possible states and these are the allowed state transitions. And so we can actually render this. So let me go back here for a second. Uh, so, yeah here and so if we go for example then to the live editor uh, for mermaid we copy and paste the state diagram definition and what we get is this maybe nice uh, diagram which represents uh, graphically uh, what 
uh, are the allowed transition for our state machines. So for example, at this point, is, uh, it becomes evident that once you leave the lone lands for the trolls clearing, there's no way for going back. Um, and also, yeah, I mean, you, you see basically the map of, of the game here. And with this, I think that's all I wanted to to present today. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions, or whatever, I'm glad to take them. Uh, before I finish, let me say just one thing. Uh, if anyone here is interested in somehow reviewing at any level the library, I would be extremely grateful because I would like to release it uh, fairly soon, but I would like to get some reviews or inputs uh, about it before doing so. So if any of you has time and is interested in this kind of thing, that would be extremely uh, awesome. So thanks you all. And yeah, if you have any comments or questions or whatever. Marco, is there some type checking to show that the transition function that you wrote in Haskell respects the topology type? Uh, I, I can show you the code briefly. So what I am doing, so let me uh, think. I mean, maybe just, just start and Go back to the example to show where, how they're connected okay. up. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, let me make this a bit bigger. So the trick somehow is that, well, you define this topology here. So mm -hmm. the list of allowed transition. Uh, this topology is wrapped in singletons. Because I mean, this is maybe not strictly necessary at this point. It's it is actually necessary later on. Uh, but the relevant thing here is that you want to lift this term that you have here at the type level, um, and then when you define your state machine, which you do down here, you have your base machine, which is indexed in a Hobbit topology. And when you basically uh, define your machine, so this is fairly hidden here. So you have this Hobbit result function, which is using this pure result function, which I cannot navigate to from GitHub. Uh, but basically, this pure result function does not return a pair, a simple pair, but it returns. Uh, well, let, let me show you actually, because I think that's the, the, the where the somehow magic happens. So I can, I need to make it smaller, otherwise I cannot navigate it. Uh, so I think this is in here. Uh, so, yeah, OK, so this is the key point. So this is the real definition, I mean, which makes uh, all the magic happen. Uh, so the initial state is actually not something of type state, but it's an initial state of state. So there's something happening in here. But the real relevant thing is that your action uh, takes a state, takes an input, and returns an action result constrained by some effects, because actually the library could do effect for machines, a topology, the state, the initial vertex, and the output. And this action result here, which should be down here somewhere here. So basically, when you want to construct something of type action result, uh, you have some constraint so basically ah. the constraint is that the transition that you want to perform from the initial vertex to the final vertex needs to be allowed by the topology. Okay. 
So that's where all the ingredients come together. Nice. To, to make it happen. Nice. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Is there no one in the queue before me? I have a feeling. All right. Don't see anyone else. So. Okay, well, then, then, then I'll ask my question, which is um, Are your state spaces always finite? Yes. Uh, so, yes and no, it quite depends on what you want to do with them. So if you want to draw them as a graph, then the answer is yes. Uh, because otherwise uh, depicting some infinite thing uh, is not going to work. And still, you have one main restriction, which uh, in any case, which comes from, well, I think it's in the definition of state machine. So it is here. So this is how you basically lift a base machine, which is the one with the topology, to a state machine, which is the one without the topology. And you have basic, I mean, these two are I mean, not extremely relevant uh, for this. Uh, but this is extremely relevant. So when you want, this is basically what allows you to uh, take the information from the type level and bring it back to the value level to do some computation at the value level. That's basically what you want to do to, to draw uh, your topology because you have the topology at the type level. You want to bring it back to the value level and then draw it. And for example, uh, if I remember correctly, this constraint does not hold for uh, integers. Uh, so, for example, you cannot have a state space, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the vertices of your graph, of your topology, uh, could not be integers because they do not satisfy this constraint. Currently, I, uh, now that I see it, I also added, uh, well, but this is actually not a constraint on that. But yeah, this is the main constraint that you always have. So you need some some type that you can uh, the mode from the type level to the value level uh, without basically losing information, I guess. I mean, I'm not an expert of singleton, so I just added here uh, the constraint which were required by the function I was using. But as far as I understand, this means, uh, yeah. So when you take uh, something from the type level and you bring it back to the value level, you basically need to have the same thing. OK, because my, my, the, the, the real question that I wanted to ask is, if, if state machine is basically either some kind of composition structure or an atomic state machine, Exactly. But if your, if your atomic state machines are always finite, it might be possible to just build up everything inductively only with composition, right? If, then, then you choose a set of composition uh, primitives and a set of, uh, of very simple atoms, which are mm -hmm. all, all constructors of your state machine type, and then, then you can do everything inductively, so to speak. That was the question that I... Um, I must admit, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, it's not, maybe, maybe it's not completely well formed in my head, the question as well. Uh, but, uh, the, I mean, there are ways to build up finite graphs inductively by only adding nodes and edges. And um, maybe similar things would apply to state machines or the, to, to the topologies of state machines, which essentially are graphs, right? Yeah. And um, 
so the the thing uh, dealing with state machines, what what I can think of, uh, I mean, I'm not sure it's relevant for your question here, but is that you basically want operations uh, where you know in theory how the uh, state spaces are going to compose. Uh, basically, you don't want just to compose state machines in in a way you don't know how the state space will look like after the composition, because otherwise you lose basically the the, the ability to represent uh, those state spaces. So you want compositional operations which uh, have kind of some well-behaved properties, and in general, the the thing which happens is more or less. The, the two operations I basically had, I had to implement uh, was the transitive closure of a graph. Uh, basically because when you run a machine multiple times and you don't know how many times, uh, your, your state space could evolve basically many times in one single step. So you need the transitive closure of, of your graph. And, and the other operation is the product graph because in general, when you compose sequentially or in parallel or in alternative, uh, uh, apriorically, the, the, the state space of the composed machine that you get is just a product of the, of the graphs of the initial machines. Hmm. Well, thank you. I think I'll have to meditate on what even my question is a bit more. But <laughs> yeah, well, happy to discuss uh, yes. whenever you want. Do we have any questions from anyone else? No. In that case, I thank you very much, Marco, for this very interesting presentation. It was really very a problem that at least I personally hadn't thought about before you introduced it to me. So I'm very happy for this talk. Well, thanks a lot uh, to you for yeah, your participation. It was good to have this wide audience. Yeah. I mean, if you have any questions or comments on the library in the future, just feel free to drop me a line. I'm always happy to talk about those things.